Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm pleased to present the hydrologic conditions report for last month. And our last photo here was taken by our new employee, Alexandria Blankenship. She went off with the crew to help them do a flow measurement at, at uh, Will Atlantic Springs in late January. And this is what it looked like. Um, that spring often is dry, but right now, Big Fanning Spring, I'll show you a photo of Big Fanning, is submerged, and so groundwork's popping up, and this spring has started to flow again. So we've got a nice flow measurement there, and you can see that terrific blue water. Um, District-wide rainfall this month, a very different picture. And this month, most of what I'm going to be emphasizing is groundwater, because that's sort of our real story this month. Last month, of course, it was the very high rainfall. We broke the record for rainfall um, district-wide in December. And uh, we were really pleased that that didn't happen for January as well. We actually had some areas that had fairly normal rainfall. Our normal rainfall is 54.7. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I that's a different number. Never mind. Our normal rainfall is 3.37. Uh, that's the average in January. And this month, we observed 4.32 as the average across the district. The lower areas of rainfall were just the areas that got really high rainfall in December. So fortunately, we didn't have such high rainfall uh, in the northwest part of our district. Uh, really high rainfall added up in the south part, and particularly Levy County, which is still very, very wet. And what that's led to is high groundwater. Well, you'll notice that this is for the end of December. This is the slide that I showed you last year, uh, last year, it was last year, last month. And uh, we have started to highlight areas of very high groundwater, areas where our long-term wells are showing in above the 90th percentile. So this is the slide we showed you last month. We had levels still coming up at the end of December. And we were commenting, I commented to you that this little hole is a little bit deceptive. That's caused by one well where we make a manual measurement almost three weeks before we um, do the survey of our wells uh, at the end of the month. So I wanted to do two things for this month. The first thing was I wanted to omit that well from the analysis to see how it changed the picture. We just don't think it's really giving us a good picture of what's going on at the end of each month to have that well in there. So I re-ran this analysis, leaving that well out. And I've also added a category for wells that are higher than the 95th percentile, not the 90th, but the 95th. I had a feeling that for January, my district map, the groundwater levels was going to be solid blue, and it was going to be very interesting. So I wanted to start looking at areas that, are there, uh, that have higher than the 95th percentile. So first I'm going to show you how December turned out when I re-ran that analysis. And so with that well gone, we still do see a low area, but we don't see what sort of looks like a, uh, you know, a, a real hole for water. And that was literally being caused by the signature of that one well where the collection date was different than the other wells. And the other thing is you can see that at the end of December, a good bit of our district was showing higher than the 95th percentile in our upper floor. And that can be very high. So I did the same thing, omitting this well, running for the end of January and adding this 95th percentile. And this is what it looks like now. Um, what you're seeing is the Florida and Upper Florida National are building up. We are still at the end of January. We are still seeing rising levels of many wells, um, a couple where we've broken records again. And um, I want to show you next kind of a time lapse. I'm going to show you end of November, end of December, and then end of January. So this is what we look like at the end of November 2018. The turquoise areas are in what we consider the normal range for groundwater. December, and then the end of January. So what you're seeing here is the Florida and aquifer really filling up over these past few months. Uh, this is what it looks like for one of our wells. This is one of our long-term wells. It goes back to 1958. And, um, it's been requested that we address some questions about trend in the Florida aquifer and in surface waters. And I have a couple comments about that. Um, we really like to show you data as far back as we have it. We don't have data that far back for all that many wells. We really have only five wells in our district that go back uh, farther than 1960. And when you look at it, this goes back to 1958. I'm quite sure there are, uh, I mean, this is basically one human lifetime's worth of water level data. 
just were not really collecting water level data that much in the early 1950s at that many places. So the problem with trend and talking about trend is that it's very dependent on the period of record that you consider. So if you looked at the trend starting here in the early 1990s, you might draw a different conclusion than if you looked at the trend beginning in 2002, or if you looked at the trend beginning back in 1958. Um, the, the story that gets shown by this well in Newbury is we, we have a lot of high levels. We really pay attention when water levels are high and when water levels are low. We have different kinds of questions and problems. But those are the things we pay attention to. There are always cycles that go up and down. And um, so we, we do see that the highs appear to have gotten lower and that the lows also appear to have gotten lower. So in the short term, since 2012, we are recovering from um, quite a long-term drought. And so that's the picture that we can see here. In comparison with the way the aquifer has been measured over the years back into 1958, um, we're coming up, but will we reach back up to those earlier levels? Take some of those more than me about hydrology to answer that question. So we are definitely recovering from that last long-term drought. Um, it's good to see those aquifer levels high, although for people whose yards are not draining because the, um, the canals are full, the ditches are full, um, they're not so pleased to see those high levels in the program. I want to turn now to surface water, and a lot of the discussion I had for you last month had to do with the Swanee River of Ellaville. That's kind of our index station right there at the junction of the Wipapuchi and Upper Swanee Rivers, and also captures the Alaska River. And you remember that in December, we were right up there, very close to uh, maximum daily values. We fortunately came down a bit during the month of January. And I uh, want to emphasize that these graphs show one year back. And they do reflect the entire period of record at the gauge in these maximum <coughs> daily values. So we can see that over the past year, at Elgin, we really ran the gamut. We were in some very low levels early in the year in March. Then we had kind of a normal summer popping up a little bit in May and June. And then we, we had quite a wet and um, flooded situation at the end of the year. So that's Ellaville. Uh, last month we showed you the flood records because we were all quite concerned with all that rainfall that we were going to continue to have more rainfall. And uh, the question was, how does this compare to some of our floods of record? So last month, this black line, which is our observed value, <coughs> ended right about here. We could see that we had come down from the flooding on Christmas Day. We've come down more during the month of January. But you can see that we're still kind of in that range that we were in for the 1997-98 floods and also for the 1947-48 floods. 2008-2009, um, the most recent flood that many of us can remember, um, Here's where the river was at this time of year for that flood. So um, don't want anyone to feel too complacent just because the rainfall has stopped. Uh, the next graph is the same thing redrawn, adding the 1972-73 flood, which is this purple line here, and pretty much goes. Uh, here's, here's. <coughs> so at this point, we're very much. Um, higher than we were during the, the, that year uh, when we had the record flow in 1970. And um, this is a, a plot that the National Weather Service publishes at the beginning of every month. It shows their estimation of how likely it is for us to have certain types, certain levels of flooding at certain points of the river. This is for the river at Ellaville. And the blue line is what the record suggests we should expect at this time of year. So according to that blue line, to get a, a flood level of 55, which is about um, maybe less than 10 feet higher than where we are right now, the probability under a normal, normal year of getting a flood level that high is right around 20%. This year, they've got it at a higher percentage. Like 30%. So that's just to get us into the minor flooding category. Normally pretty common to be that flooded uh, at this time of year. This year a little more common. 
uh, I think what might be more useful for people to see is the likelihood that we'll get into moderate flooding, which under normal situation would be somewhere between 5% and 2%, but this year they think it's more like 10% chance that we'll get up into that moderate category of flooding. So I'm just cautioning everyone, we do have high groundwater and that's affecting the ability of the rivers to, to drain off and, um, and we aren't out of the woods yet as far as draining. This is just a picture of all of our stream flow stations that we monitor. These are actually, I say we, but these are actually stations monitored mostly by the U.S. Geological Survey. We're still above the 90th percentile, uh, below the confluence of the Santa Fe River and also still at um, Three rivers, and um, just above that confluence at Branford, we're still above the 90th percentile as far as our flows. But last, I don't know if you remember last month, this pretty much all the dots were black, and so we've gone down in some cases actually back to the normal levels, and um, and other cases we're still a bit high, particularly over on the on the western side of our district. Uh, this is a photograph. I'm back to to uh, Fanny Spring. Uh, so this is <coughs> fanning, and you can see that the water is quite dark. The flooding has gone up on the river, so it's actually submerging that fence and, and the dock area and the swimming area. And um, I do want to mention that uh, right now that spring is browned out. The river has encroached on it, so it's flowing at a very low rate. As the river levels uh, subside, the springs we expect that generally start to flow very strongly, particularly when the groundwater levels are so we're going to be deploying our folks, uh, our field crew, to go out and make additional springs measurements as those springs pop up. And uh, just very quickly, this is what this sort of a situation looks like. Again, we're here at Fanning Springs, right up there at the head spring. What we can see is that the water level went from 2 up to nearly 12, rose almost 10 feet during November and December. It's coming down a little bit. So water level coming up from the river, um, submerging that spring, and so the next slide you'll see is the flow rate. These are all calculated by the U.S. Geological Survey. Flow rate was going along right about 60 CFS. The river came up, submerged the spring, and this measurement shows that they're at about 10 CFS as the river encroached into the spring. Now they have this blue line that goes down and actually shows negative flows. That's complicated. It's because the equation that relates flow to level doesn't have, it's not accounting in this case for the backwater from the river. And that's why they send people out to do these flow measurements so that they can improve their ratings. So eventually when this data gets approved and published, these low negative numbers are going to go up, they'll probably be between zero and, and 10. So is, is that why you're saying that the, the, uh, the real-time information at the spring uh, downstream of the head is not accurate? It's, so uh, it's, it's provisional. And most of the time, it is fairly accurate. They take measurements. Yeah, but I mean, during these high times. During these high times, you, you uh, I mean, that's the thing about the web. You, you need to realize that a lot of this is real time being provided right away, and so it is provisional. But that, so, what he was doing was actually checking at the spring. He was checking right at the spring. Um, the the mm -hmm. folks are out there making a measurement um, out there. So we need to keep making measurements. Even though we have a long history, we need to be able to measure under all sorts of conditions. So we'll be telling people to do that to, to the extent we're able. Um, this is from the National Weather Service, and it's their river flood outlook. You can see that they consider really all of our area in a moderate river flood risk for the next few months. This is February through April. So um, we're drying out now. Actually, it looks like we're getting into a rainy weekend. I, I seen some prognosis that February will end up being more on the rainy side. It started out fairly well, but it was starting to get more rain. So we need to not let our guard down as far as uh, flooding. And if you're living along the river, you should just be aware that um, the levels are, at the very least, going to take a while to go down and maybe even come back. Here's our precipitation outlook um, for February to April. And that's what's driving that moderate flood risk outlook they're calling for. Um, and above, I'm trying to use tiny little letters here. Um, they're calling for a 40% chance that this area will have higher than normal rainfall. 
and 30% chance that this area that includes Georgia will have a uh, higher level of rainfall. So our three-month outlook, has, it's not quite as tight in on North Florida as it was. It's spread out to include a larger geographic area. Um, I did want to give you a little retrospective of the year 2018, just to go back to, um, sort of circling back around to talk about groundwater again. Groundwater has a longer memory than surface water. That's the way I look at it. And if you total up total rainfall using our next drag rain data sets, um, this is what we came up with. You can see that the coastal counties right up into parts of Lafayette and Gilchrist um, had quite a bit higher rainfall. Our normal annual rainfall is 54.7 inches. So that's based on 1932 all the way to 2018. That's what our normal rainfall is district wide. So what that means is if you got over 75 inches of rain, uh, you had 30% more rain than, um, than normal. Uh, and that follows um, 2017, which wasn't exactly a dry year either. So um, I sent this around, sent this slide around, <coughs> and, um, circulating it just to, on our, we're doing aquifer alerts now, so that went out on the aquifer alert and uh, made it available to some of the local governments as well. Uh, the perspective of what this year has been like compared to other years, I think, is really useful. So in summary, um, lower rainfall, but conditions remain very much saturated. Water levels are higher than usual for the season. Our aquifer and aquifer district-wide rose half a foot, and we're now at the 92nd, the 92nd percentile. Last, uh, at the end of December, we were at the 84th percentile. And that's taking all those percentile values to with that figure and just averaging them throughout the district. Uh, we also, every week, we, we um, do a survey by telemetry of about 80 wells. And most of those at the end of January, 81% of those wells were above the 90th percentile. That number was 69% at the end of December. So we're still filling up the aquifer at this point. Our long-term wells are showing that a lot of them, this is in the, the hydrologic conditions report, I'll refer you to that, to our figures where we show an index well for each county. But uh, we had higher than average levels through most of 2018 in all of our district counties except Madison and Suwannee. So um, just a big year for the Florida aquifer, <laughs> pretty much everywhere. Uh, as far as our rivers, uh, we've gone down since the Christmas flood, but we're still seeing minor flooding, uh, especially on the lower Santa Fe River. And three rivers in Port Hawaii are still showing um, uh, in the minor flooding category on the river out on the um, southeast of the forecast center gauges. Our 12-month surplus was 10.7 inches, so that's looking back the past 12 months. At this time last year, we were running a deficit of 3.12 inches, so that's another big change from last year. And uh, this is getting monotonous, isn't it? That they're still saying we are in an El Nino watch, and we've been hearing this since May, that we're in an El Nino watch. And what's happening is the sea surface conditions in the, in the Pacific are sort of bouncing along, a little normal, a little higher than normal, and so it really depends from month to month, whether they bump it up into the official, we're in an El Nino. Um, but they're continuing the, the idea that we may uh, be in El Nino conditions. In the winter, that means cooler and wetter conditions for us. In the spring, I'll, I'll just have to go and look. I'm not sure that, that uh, it makes much difference once we're into springtime if we start into an El Nino. We really thought we had started the El Nino in December. I was expecting at the end of December that they would issue um, the statement that we're actually in an El Nino, but they're still saying there is a chance that it will form. Okay, so, very likely chance. That's it for January 2019. I'd be happy to answer questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. It is now the, the manual measurements measure exactly that. They, they our acoustic Doppler current profiler um, manages the, it, it measures water velocity through columns 
We pull it across a cross section. It measures the geometry of that cross section. So the manual measurements, when they're highly repeatable, and that's why we really need to be continuing to make them. The rated measurements, the estimates, um, there's much more uncertainty with those. And it, what I found is that it really depends on where you are, because our springs have these backwater conditions that are much trickier to get these daily estimates, hourly estimates. And um, so I, I always treat those estimates that are generated every day by the USGS with a little more caution, just knowing that they are provisional. Eventually, they will be matched to the manual measurements, and that's what quality assurance does. And when the USGS approves those measurements, then um, I have much more confidence in those. I don't know if, if I... Well, yeah, I, I mean, well, I, I always wonder how confident we are of the old measurements. I, I've heard from a number of sources that it's very hard, like the silver springs or issues I can get from to really know for sure. Well, the old measurements were made in very much the same way. They did a cross-section. You run a tagline and you run along that cross section, and the only thing really that's different is that it was a mechanical flow meter. It um, looks like a little propeller, and uh, it, you basically counted the number of revolutions and then moved to the next section. So, for the for the technology of the time, I think those are those are. Um, I mean, they're all we have for one thing, but um, I I don't think that they're in a different category as as our current way. We can do a lot more measurements in a lot less time using the technology. Okay. Unless you'll have questions of me. 